This is Dr. Ken Anderson, and I uh, want to tell you about the next steps towards cure as part of the Comey 2020 uh, video uh, meeting. As all of you know, there have been remarkable therapeutic advances in multiple myeloma over the last 10 to 15 years with the proteasome inhibitors, ortezomib, carfilzomib, exazomib, the immunomodulatory drugs, thalidomide, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, an HDAC inhibitor, panabinostat, monoclonal antibodies, elituzumab, daratumumab, and most recently, isotuximab, and now a nuclear transport inhibitor, salinexor. All of these agents showed promise in early preclinical studies in the laboratory and in animals. They went to clinical trials, and as of right now, there are 27 different FDA approvals of these agents used in combinations to treat myeloma, and in many patients, myeloma is a chronic illness. However, we still need urgently new therapies because approximately 30,000 new patients in the United States were diagnosed last year, and 13,000 of them unfortunately died. My thought for how we're going to achieve curative therapy in the myeloma in the future is shown on this slide. We're gonna to need to develop therapies that target both the tumor and the bone marrow microenvironment, and they can overcome the constitutive and evolving genomic and epigenomic heterogeneity. We need to use biologically based targeted and immune therapies in combination. These will have been validated in preclinical studies and we'll use them to treat subsets of patients that will have been defined by profiling and these trials will be informed by biomarkers. Ultimately, these therapies will be used early in the disease course, for example, in smoldering multiple myeloma to avoid clinical sequelae both achieving minimal residual disease and restoring host anti-myeloma immunity will be required if we're going to achieve long-term disease-free survival and potential cure. I wanna spend my time talking about new genomic and epigenomic targets, strategies to target the tumor microenvironment, new ideas on how to block or trigger protein degradation, and finish up with some thoughts about novel immune treatments. Firstly, when one sequences multiple myeloma, we find that it's a markedly heterogeneous disease. You can see on the left-hand side in patients at diagnosis, there's anywhere between one and 45,000 mutations present at diagnosis, and in fact, there are uh, underlying mutational processes accounting for these mutations, such as APOBEC, AID, homologous recombination, and the age underlying processes for mutational uh, driving mutation. On the right-hand side of this slide are the mutations in their frequency, and you can see that, in fact, the KRAS, NRAS mutations are most common but we actually don't have, in, as in some cancers, solid tumors, or for example, in Waldenstrom's, a predominant driver mutation in our disease. Rather, we have, when we look at uh, transcriptomic heterogeneity, we really look based on RNA sequencing, and we can find at least 11 different subgroups of multiple myeloma that have a distinct clinical outcome. And on the right-hand side of this slide, we can actually even look with single-cell RNA sequencing and show differences between the CD138 positive tumor cell and the CD138 negative bone marrow microenvironment, even within individual patients. So there's variation between patients and uh, within patients. Now shown on this slide here are the is a circus plot of the genomic abnormalities present at a patient newly diagnosed, and then when the patient relapses, and then at the second relapse of myeloma. And you can see that these genetic heterogeneity and the frequency of genetic abnormalities increases in complexity as the disease progresses. 
And we can look as shown down here in the lower left and find that sometimes patients have the same clone of cells present when they relapse. Sometimes they have a clone and a subclone present at diagnosis, which actually becomes more predominant at relapse. Sometimes as shown here, they have a clone at diagnosis with the er evolution of a new subclone at relapse. And sometimes they have a clone and subclone at diagnosis one of the subclone goes away, but a new one appears. We and others have followed this clonal evolution over time, and we want to understand what are the common pathways or mutations that may underlie relapse. And one can show here that there are a common uh, targets and common pathways that have been implicated. So what do we do today? Well, we use targeted sequencing with patients with newly diagnosed myeloma, and we have a panel of implicated genes as shown here. And when we use the sequencing of these genes, we can show that there are translocations or copy number changes as shown here. We can show, for example, that there are uh, chromosome 1Q amplification. We can look, as shown in the lower left, at the various subgroups of multiple myeloma, and we can find copy number changes or karyotypic changes, et cetera. But the reason we're interested, as you are, in sequencing at the time of diagnosis is shown here. If you have one allele of P17P deletion, uh, P53, abnormal, your patient outcome is as shown here. But if you have both alleles uh, aberrant, your poor outcome is shown here. So it matters clinically. Today, the really arguably only therapy that we use that is genomically targeted is venetoclax. You all know that venetoclax targets BCL2, but in multiple myeloma, in the 1114 translocation patients or those who otherwise express BCL2, if one uses oral venetoclax together with the proteasome inhibitor bortezomib, the outcome as shown here in the progression-free survival is remarkably good compared to those patients who are not expressing overexpressing BCL2 who have really not very beneficial outcome at all. Now, in terms of going forward and trying to target myeloma in a precision or a genetically based way, one can show on this slide the frequency with which the mutations have been found and the ras raf -MAP kinase pathway from the size of the letters here is the most common pathway that has been implicated. Recently, there's been in solid tumors, a novel agent, AMG510, that targets a particular mutation, KRASG12C, and in fact, that is present frequently in colorectal and lung cancer. In our series, it really isn't a common mutation in multiple myeloma. Shown here in the upper right is a very exciting umbrella trial that is ongoing as we speak, where we're trying to target genetic mutations. Patients with relapsed myeloma are sequenced in terms of their tumor, and they all receive isotuc uh, exazomib, rather, and pomalidomide dex as well as a targeted agent that targets the various abnormalities that would be found in their tumor. This trial is a hypothesis generating. It will show whether we can use a targeted agent and hit the abnormal clone present in individual patients. And if we can, this will be an impetus to further pursue these targeted therapies in multiple myeloma. We also can target, as I mentioned earlier, the underlying processes that account for uh, these frequent mutations in myeloma, such as homologous recombination or APABAC activity. And as shown on the right here, and if we can't really target the specific mutation, couldn't we target the consequences of the genomic abnormality? And this example shows you if you have amplified MYC, this accounts for 
increased replicative stress and increased oxidative stress. And in this setting, if you block the replicative stress response, for example, with an ATR inhibitor, or if you increase the oxidative stress, for example, with a proteasome inhibitor, you can induce apoptosis. So these are examples of genetic targeting of multiple myeloma. We also have early evidence for epigenetic targeting in myeloma. Shown on the left is the KDM3A. It's a demethylase, and it removes methyl groups from promoters of genes, such as the gene IRF4, which is a hallmark in myeloma. We and others have shown if you inhibit KMF the KDM3A, either genetically or pharmacologically, you can restore methylation of IRF4. And in so doing, you can inhibit myeloma cell growth as well as homing of the tumor cell to the microenvironment. On the right here is the opposite, not a demethylase, but rather a methyl transferase. PRMT5, and this is a methyl transferase that's highly expressed in multiple myeloma, and we've shown that if you inhibit it with genetics or pharmacologically, you can inhibit myeloma cell growth. There's an oral inhibitor, and phase one clinical trials are ongoing as we speak. So genetic and epigenetic therapies are one way that is proceeding very rapidly to advance the patient outcome in myeloma. What about targeting the microenvironment? We've been interested in this for many, many years. And as you know, the myeloma microenvironment in the bone marrow is composed of accessory cells, such as myeloid-derived suppressor cells or plasma cytoid dendritic cells or tumor-associated macrophages. These immune cells promote myeloma cell growth, survival, and drug resistance and they confer immunosuppression. So we and others have been interested in studying how to inhibit the activity of these accessory cells by blocking the interaction or the consequences of the interaction. Very exciting new data is shown on this slide. If a plasma cytoid dendritic cell interacts with a multiple myeloma cell, there's upregulation of CD73 present on the myeloma cell, as shown here, as well as on this plasma cytoid dendritic cell. So what is CD73? Well, it's a cell surface enzyme that converts AMP to adenosine, and adenosine is immunosuppressive. So CD73 promotes tumor growth, and it triggers immunosuppression. Consequently, if you block CD73, as shown on this slide, in a completely patient autologous system, that is patient myeloma cells, patient T cells, and patient plasma cytoid dendritic cells, if you block CD73, you can in fact trigger CD8 cytolytic activity against the patient's own myeloma. A second example of a metabolic manipulation is shown here. When plasma cytoid dendritic cells interact with myeloma, there's upregulation of what's called ENO1, as shown here. It's a marked upregulation. And this is an enzyme that converts 2 phosphodiglycerate to phosphophosphoenolpyruvate. And in fact, it facilitates tumor cell invasion and metastasis and aerobic glycolysis. And this is therefore a good target in cancer. So here's an example again of our autologous system where you have patient myeloma cells, patient T lymphocytes, and patient plasma cytoid dendritic cells. This time we're blocking the glycolytic enzyme ENO1. And when we block ENO1, we can get T cell mediated killing, autologous T cells killing autologous myeloma, or if we block ENO1, we can also get natural killer cells, autologous natural killer cells, killing multiple myeloma. Here's the lysis. When one inhibits ENO1, 
by patient NK cells of their own myeloma. That's all I wanted to mention about targeting the microenvironment. I do want to mention that we are making advances also in targeting protein degradation. You all know well that we have targeted the proteasome with bortezomib and carfilzomib and exazomib, but you can also target the ubiquitin receptors upstream of the proteasome. These ubiquitin receptors bring the ubiquitinated protein to the proteasome for degradation. We've targeted ubiquitin receptor RPN13, which is expressed in myeloma, with a drug that's shown here. It's a specific drug because if you CRISPR caspase 9 out the target RPN13, it doesn't work. But the most important point is shown here. These are patients whose myeloma is resistant to the proteasome inhibitor bortezomib, and they're sensitive to this ubiquitin receptor inhibitor, RA190. So in other words, if you block this ubiquitin proteasome pathway upstream of the proteasome, maybe you can overcome proteasome inhibitor resistance. Excitingly, blocking this ubiquitin receptor also can trigger an immune response. It turns out this ubiquitin receptor is also on dendritic cells. And if you block this receptor on dendritic cells, you result in the maturation of dendritic cells and the stimulation or triggering of T cell and NK cell immunity. So T cells lyse autologous myeloma and NK cells lyse autologous myeloma, this ubiquitin receptor inhibitor, in other words, has direct effects on the tumor by overcoming proteasome inhibitor resistance, but also stimulates NK cell and T cell immunity. Now, the immunomodulatory drugs have taught us a lot. As you all know, thalidomide, lenalidomide, and pomalidomide bind to the ubiquitin-3 ligase cerebellum complex and trigger degradation of Icarus 1 and 3 and downstream events. In immune cells, T cells and NK cells, these imids do the same thing, but they downregulate or degrade Icarus and Alios, and in this example, allow IL-2 transcription and secretion to occur, thereby upregulating the T cell and NK cell immune response. As we're sitting here, there are the new cell mods that are 20 to 34, 30 fold more uh, potent in terms of cerebellum binding affinity, and they can achieve responses in 30% of patients whose myeloma is resistant to pomalidomide. Recent developments allow us to understand resistance to the imids. And one way to mediate resistance is in fact by down-regulating cerebellum. So we did a CRISPR-Cas9 caspase 9 screen, and we showed that the signalosomes regulate cerebellum levels in myeloma cells. And in fact, the sensitivity to the image goes down as the signalosomes are knocked out. So we can now and have ongoing efforts to restore signalosome levels in myeloma, thereby restoring cerebellum and image sensitivity. In the microenvironment, we've shown that certain factors like TNF and interleukin-6 confer resistance to the image, again, by a CRISPR-Cas9 screen. And shown in this cartoon, TNF and IL-6 are down-regulating TRAF. And with down-regulation of TRAF2, you get activation of ERK-1-2 signaling. So in this example, perhaps what we could do is target ERK-1-2 signaling and restore image sensitivity that's conferred in the bone marrow microenvironment by TNF or IL-6. We've also been educated or informed by the IMIDs to look for new targets. I've mentioned already that the IMIDs such as pomalidomide bind to cerebellum as shown here and degrade Icaros, but we've shown recently that pomalidomide and other IMIDs bind another substrate in myeloma cells called P53-related kinase. 
and it's an independent pathway. So this has spurred efforts to target P53 related kinase for novel therapeutics, or maybe to add agents that target P53 related kinase along with the image to restore sensitivity. And very recent data has decided and informed new substrates or targets of the image in the microenvironment. So this time, the image actually activates something called ZAP70 that's present in T cells and natural killer cells. So the image, as I've mentioned, can bind to cerebellum and trigger immune activity, but we've recently shown that the image directly bind ZAP70, leading again to increase in this slide in granzyme B and NK cell mediated killing. So the image as a class of drugs have not only been remarkably effective therapeutically, but they're now telling us about new targets whereby they can mediate their anti-tumor activity and providing new ways to manipulate these mechanisms, both in the tumor and in the microenvironment. Finally, in terms of tumor degradation, as shown in this cartoon, the uh, immunomodulatory drugs, as I've mentioned, bind to cerebellum, the ubiquitin-3 ligase complex. So there's a new class of medicines called the degronomids or the protax, and these, like the imids, bind to cerebellum, but unlike the imids, they have a covalent linker to the protein or substrate you would like to degrade. So they bind to cerebellum, but they also place a ubiquitin tag on the substrate protein you would like to degrade. And these agents are coming to the clinic very rapidly. In breast cancer, the estrogen receptor is being selectively degraded. And in prostate cancer, the androgen receptor is being selectively degraded. In myeloma, we have several substrates shown down here in the lower right corner that will be degraded in clinical trials in the relatively near future. Finally, a few thoughts about immune therapies. You've heard previously in the Comey sessions about BCMA targeting agents. Shown here is the BCMA immunotoxin, that's belantamib, amab, bamfidotin. And you know that it selectively expresses, uh, targets BCMA uh, on myeloma cells. And most recently in far advanced myeloma, a randomized phase two trial has shown activity in about one third of patients with triple refractory multiple myeloma. So this BCMA toxin, which has immune activity and also stimulates uh, a uh, orostatin immunotoxin mediated mechanism of death is moving towards regulatory approval. The bispecific T cell engagers targeting BCMA are also of great interest. This is the um, cell gene BMS, uh, so called BITE or bispecific T cell engager, where one has a binding site for BCMA, in fact, two such uh, motifs, and also binding site to CD3, thereby bringing the T cells to the BCMA positive myeloma cells at the American Society of Hematology in a dose escalation trial, particularly when the dose was six to 10 milligrams, the response rates in far advanced myeloma were quite high. We've worked with another bispecific T cell engager called Amgen or AMG701. And I show this slide because these bispecific T cell engagers are not going to be used alone. Here is our data combining a bispecific T-cell engager 701 with immunomodulatory drugs. And the benefit of combined immune therapy in this way is that you can get marked myeloma killing at low effector T-cell ratios at low doses of the bispecific T-cell engager. And shown here in the lower right, this is an autologous system where you can augment killing of patients' own myeloma by their own effector cells when you use very low doses of IMID together with low doses of the bispecific T-cell engager. 
CAR T cells are very exciting, as has been discussed at Comey this year. This is the published data for the BB2121 study, where you know that if patients were given 150 million CAR T cells or more, they had marked responses. In fact, 17 of 17 patients had MRD negative disease. You also know that the progression-free survival, in spite of that track record, was very short, with only about 17.7 months progression-free survival, even if patients achieved MRD negativity. Now, the Chinese have been leaders in the development of CAR T cells in multiple myeloma, and they actually have used a particular vector that binds to two different domains on BCMA, hopefully in so doing to increase the affinity, potency, and selectivity. And in fact, they have reported on 74 patients from their LEGEND2 trial that they can get high, deep, and durable overall response and manageable toxicity. J&J &J has taken the same CAR T cell vector and now is doing trials in the North America with the CARTITUDE 1 clinical trial. It again has these two binding domains to BCMA. And presented at the American Society of Hematology were 23 patients treated with this CAR T cell in the CARTITUDE trial. And what they found was that 100% of 17 of valuable patients were MRD negative at day 28. So that's very, very exciting indeed. But I do want to point out that the median follow-up here was only six months. And I mentioned a minute ago that in the Bluebird study, relapses, the median progression-free survival, even for the MRD negative patients, was about 18 months. So this particular experience, while very exciting, will require more follow-up. We've tried what's called RNA-derived CAR T cells. RNA-derived CAR T cells are using RNA, mRNA, instead of DNA to transfect the CD8-positive T cells. And you can show that you can express the CAR, BCMA CAR is here, and it's a transient expression lasting only about 10 to 12 days. It very effectively lyses uh, myeloma cell lines and patient cells, and the beauty of this system is you could use these RNA-based CAR T cells over and over again as we use other myeloma medications. Very excitingly, we have what's called the BAT CAR T cell concept. Shown on the left here is the traditional CAR T cell where you actually have the co-stimulatory domains bound to the SCVFV BCMA binding domain that binds to the BCMA on the tumor cell. Here is the BAT uh, car on the right-hand side where you have the same construct, but this time the um, tumor targeting antibody is labeled with a molecule, show you, for example, fluorescein. So you could use a monoclonal antibody with fluorescein on it that we already have antibodies such as daratumumab or elatuzumab. And in fact, this CAR would only be activated when, in fact, the CAR bearing an antibody to fluorescein reacted with fluorescein on the tumor cell. Now, what is the advantage of this? Well, you could titrate the CAR, that CAR T cells in order to get a very appropriate therapeutic window. It, it actually could be used in terms of multiplexibility. What I mean by that is you could have multiple different antibodies, daratumumab, elatuzumab, or others with fluorescein on their surface and then come along with your bat car and target multiple antigens at once. And such redundancy might prevent antigen escape and related resistance. Finally, we're excited about what's called peptide-stimulated adoptive immunotherapy. We've actually produced a BCMA peptide, which is very immunogenic. And here is the proof of principle in HLA-2 positive donors or patients 
that repeated exposure to this BCMA peptide can induce memory cytolytic T cells in these two normal donors against BCMA positive myeloma. So the protocol is to vaccinate patients with multiple myeloma to induce these cytolytic memory T cells targeting BCMA, to harvest the cells and expand them just as you would CAR T cells and reinfuse them as adoptive immunotherapy. The beauty of this experiment is that you could then vaccinate these patients later on to maintain these autologous memory BCMA directed T cells and prolong response. And finally, what about combination therapies? Well, this one is an example of combination immune treatments involving the vaccine and this time BCMA bites. So, you know, with regular bites, you actually have the bite that binds to BCMA on myeloma and attracts the CD3 positive T cells. On the right hand side, if you vaccinated the patient first, you could get high levels of memory T cells as shown here. And then you could use the bite to bring these memory immune cells to the BCMA positive myeloma cells and hopefully thereby improve efficacy. So what I've tried to do, albeit quickly, is to tell you that we've made a lot of progress together, but the best is yet to come. I think we're gonna get some therapies in the future that target the tumor and the microenvironment. They will be able to overcome the genetic and evolving uh, heterogeneity. We're gonna need to use targeted therapies and immune combinations therapies together. We're gonna define what are the best combinations. We're gonna treat the subsets of patients most likely to respond. And we're gonna use biomarkers to know that we have the right dose and schedule. Ultimately, when we have these new therapies, they're efficacious and they have a good therapeutic index, we'll use them earlier in the disease prior to the development of clinical sequelae, for example, in smoldering myeloma. And the holy grail, if we can achieve minimal residual disease with this approach and we can restore host antimyeloma immunity, I think then we really will achieve long-term disease-free survival and potential cure. And finally, this is my United Nations Against Multiple Myeloma. The um, laboratory uh, team on the right-hand side and the clinical team on the left-hand side, and there's bench to bedside and back translation that is involving international collaborations. Particularly in this pandemic, worldwide pandemic with COVID-19, never has it been more important than to collaborate and to work together to better the health of patients, not only with multiple myeloma, but with COVID-19 in this example. And myeloma collaborations have really set an example for how we can not only do better in our disease, but do better for COVID-19, oh, God willing, in the very near future. Thanks very much.